Time of Grace with Mark Jeske is made possible by the financial support of the Time of Grace viewers and partners in this area. Do you suffer from GDD, by which I mean gratitude deficit disorder? Have you ever asked yourself, what makes things funny? What do we laugh at? What, what really, where really does humor come from? Well, if I'm going to be completely honest, on behalf of all men, of guys everywhere, we laugh at other people's discomfort and misery. Like, it's always going to be funny in cartoons to see people slip on banana peels. We always laugh at people falling down. You know, another thing I think we make jokes about or crack uh, we make wisecracks and comments about is things that we're really afraid of. We laugh, we pretend to laugh about things that where we really have some fear. So, for instance, if we're hearing something that's really astounding news, we'll clap our hands on our chest and say, well, I'm having the big one. Whoa, like that really hit me, as though we're having a heart attack, even though heart attacks are dreadful uh, episodes in people's lives. Or we'll say, boy, I just can't concentrate. It's my ADD kicking in, even if we really don't have it, because we're afraid. ADD, attention deficit disorder, is really makes it really hard for people to concentrate. Or, for instance, when we have trouble remembering something, we'll be groping for some facts. We just can't get it back, and we've forgotten something obvious, and we'll say, man, it's my Alzheimer's again. Alzheimer's disease is a really heavy, serious blow to land on somebody. It makes people confused about who they are. They no longer recognize their loved ones, and every day becomes an ordeal because nothing seems to be working right. One of the sort of examples of a, of a joke that I will often tell on myself is if I feel like an outsider or I feel like I've been rejected in some kind of way, I'll say, well, I'm in the leper colony again, and everybody kind of laughs. But you know, there still are leper colonies. Leprosy still exists, and it truly is one of the most horrible it's one of the most horrible diseases known to man and womankind on earth. So it's one of the most miserable things to get. Not necessarily outrageously painful, but everything else about it is bad. You're lonely. You're ugly. You're treated like an outsider. You're kept away from human society. And then one of the fears is that in ancient times it might just be a punishment from God. And so it makes you hate your life and fear for your eternity as well. And truly enough, there are probably eight different instances of leprosy in the Bible, five in the Old Testament. And three of those represented a time when leprosy was a punishment from God. Maybe you remember the story of Naaman, who was an Aramean general who had leprosy. Elisha healed him. Maybe you remember the story of King Uzziah, who got so full of himself and got so egotistical, he went into the temple, pushed the priests and Levites out of the way and said, give me that thing, and he was going to burn incense. I'm going to be a priest. I'm going to be a king and a priest, he said. And the, they all said, get out of here. Are you crazy? Get out of here. Get out of here. You don't belong. You're not a Levite. And he said, give me that thing. <clears throat> and he became a leper instantly and had to live sequestered, even though he was king. King Uzziah had to live in a leper colony for the rest of his life. In New Testament times, Jesus had three interactions with a leper. Simon, the, I hope, ex-leper where he had a good dinner. He healed a man who was leprous. And then there's this event, the most famous of them all. I'd like to invite you to watch our Lord and Savior, Jesus, at work meeting a leper colony on the move. There were 10 of them. That story is found in your Bible in Luke chapter 17. And the story starts at verse 11. And I'd like you not only 
to watch what an amazingly powerful Savior you have, but watch Jesus also as a teacher, sharing important things that believers need to know and modeling important attitudes that believers need to adopt. And I can't think of any better time than right now in a time of thanksgiving when you and I can get a little uh, therapy for our G GDD, I call it, gratitude deficit disorder, and let Jesus teach us a few things. Our story starts as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Luke 17, and the story starts at verse 11. He's on his way to Jerusalem and he's traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. So he's heading south and drove his disciples crazy because he went through Samaria, which was no man's land for the Jews. You know that, right? That Israel was sort of in two halves with a side section. They usually preferred to go around what is today the country of Jordan. But Jesus kept walking through because he was interested in forming faith relationships with Samaritans too. He cared about Samaritans, though initially they didn't care about him. And ironically, this to me is one of the biggest ironies in New Testament history. The holiest people at Jesus' time were the Pharisees, and yet when we use that word today, it's a word no one ever wants used to describe himself, right? Do you want to be called a Pharisee? I don't think so. Why? Because it means you're acting like a hypocrite. You're acting like a proud, arrogant jerk. You're judgmental. Ironically, a cuss word back then among Jewish people was, you're like a Samaritan. That's like drug dealer, tax collector, and prostitute. Samaritan was an abusive word that you'd use to put somebody down. But ironically, because of, uh, of a parable Jesus told about a good Samaritan and about a real-life event with a real Samaritan, what was a disagreeable concept back then. Now, in our language today, if I say, oh man, you are such a Samaritan, you say, thank you. Because that means you helped somebody. To be a good Samaritan today means you will go out of your way to help somebody else in a time of need. Now, he's on the border and he's going to walk through the territory of the Samaritans. And he was going into a village and he ran on the suburbs outside of town he ran into that village's leper colony. Ten miserable people. Ten people with skin lesions that made them embarrassed at how they looked. Ten people who had numbness in their fingers and were terrified that they would start falling off. Leprosy makes your toes curl. Leprosy also attacks your eyes and it causes blindness. Here are ten people watching themselves die slowly and their only company was other lepers. And as Jesus came by, from a respectful distance, the people in the leper colony called out for help because they had heard there was something magic about this man. They didn't maybe exactly know what to believe. They, I'm sure, were not allowed to be close enough to hear his teaching, but they had heard enough to know maybe he can help us. Jesus, Master, and they're hoping, master of my disease, have pity on us. You don't owe us, but at least feel sorry for our crummy lives. Help us. Help. Help. Jesus saw them and he said, go show yourselves to the priests. That, that to me is kind of a head scratcher because uh, normally the priests were only found to be found in Jerusalem around the temple, but perhaps they rotated in and out like the Levites and they had um, places where they could live. The Levites and perhaps the priests as well had Levitical towns where they were allowed to farm and they rotated their service like uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, only had a two-week shift in Jerusalem and then he would go back home. So maybe the village did have a priest there who was also their public hygiene and sanitation officer. And if you claimed that you had been healed of your leprosy by divine intervention or, or maybe by spontaneous recovery and remission, 
you had to be certified before you could walk on the streets again and go back to your old home. So Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they all went, which is a good sign. Because that suggests to me that all ten were believers. They didn't argue with them. They didn't say, aren't you going to do something? They walked with their fingers still numb, if they had any fingers at all left, with ugly white and red gigantic lesions and rashes on their skin. Maybe some of them had to be carried, but they all went. They didn't argue with them. And I love how Jesus works. He does this all the time. Sometimes he does an explosive miracle that everybody can see, but so often his preferred method is the delayed reaction. Because what he's interested in is not the abolition of leprosy at that time. When he comes back, there will be no more leprosy. But what he's interested in even more than the abolition of leprosy is the connecting of dying sinners with the life source, reconnecting dying branches with the central vine. Through faith, you become immortal and you can laugh at any disaster, any physical ailment, any struggle of finances, any brokenness in your family and relationships can all be healed and have a happy future if and only if you are connected in faith to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's all or nothing. And so he did his speaking and his miracles all with one goal in mind. And it wasn't making people's lives more comfortable. It was connecting you in faith to the life source so that you would become immortal, forgiven and immortal. It's all about faith. And so he gave them all a challenge. Go show yourselves to the priest. And I can imagine one or more of those guys looking down at the stumps on their knuckles where there used to be fingers and saying, go show the priest what? The place where fingers used to be? Go show the priest what? This big old white patch on my arm that says you're dying? Go show the priest what? My nose collapsing? I look like a freak. But they all went. And to me, that's a happy thought. And while they were walking, while they were walking, the lesions went away. They disappeared. And healthy skin replaced it. While they were walking, missing fingers just grew back. While they were walking, their noses went back to their normal shape. And the ones that were losing or had lost their vision could suddenly see clearly again. And those whose toes had gone all curly and, and crunched up, making it difficult to walk, suddenly had a great stride because their toes could do what God designed toes to do, which is to stabilize your body, dig in, and propel you forward. Now, what Jesus was desperate to know is what's going on in your head when you have seen what's going on in your body and in your life. And he was in for a severe disappointment because nine of them just kept walking and thought, what luck. One of them knew how important it was to think and trace backward cause and effect why his life got better. Only one guy connected the dots and said, the traveling rabbi has changed the world for me. Think and thank and he stopped and said, I have to tell him that it worked and give him my gratitude. And nine Jews and one Samaritan, who do you think was the one to think and thank? It was the Samaritan. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God. He connected the dots. My life is good because of God. God is good. God is good to me. He likes me. In a loud voice, he wanted everybody to hear. He didn't care, do I sound like a lunatic? I don't care. I can see again. I can be with you again. My loneliness, my leper colony days are over. I can walk again. I can touch. I feel my fingertips again. 
and I don't look ugly anymore. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said, where is everybody? We're not ten cleansed? Where's the other nine? Where's your brother? Where's your friends? Maybe they weren't really friends. They were just stuck in leper jail together. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It is through your faith that I am doing these things for you. I did all these things to build your faith. And you're thrilling me. You're making my day, Samaritan, because I can see that what I did for you has strengthened the feeble faith that was there. Now you have a stronger faith. You're going to die again, Samaritan. Something else will kill you. Maybe you won't die of your leprosy, but you're going to die of something else. But connected to me, you are forgiven. You, people of earth, Connected to Christ, your status changes from dying mortal to everlasting immortal. Your status changes from rebel, evildoer, wretch, a sinful wretch like you and me, connected in faith to Jesus Christ, everything he bought for you on the cross pours into your life as a gift. Claim it. It's yours. It's free. It's already been bought. Just be quiet, stop arguing, stop protecting yourself, stop defending yourself, stop arguing with God, stop all that stuff and just hold out your hands and let him put it into your hands. His love for you is unconditional. And that message of unconditional love is what creates the very faith that we need in a Savior who knows no limits of what he can do in the physical world, but even more importantly, knows no limits for how many people his touch brings forgiveness to. Through faith in Christ, suddenly your life has new meaning. Suddenly you can feel confident again because you're somebody. You are loved by God, forgiven by God, important to God, precious to God. And that means that since you are immortal and your future is guaranteed, you can survive anything going on. It also means that on days like today, right now, you can put the brakes on the terrible speed at which we're all rushing forward. You can pause and reflect to do two important things, to think and to thank. You know why that's so important? Because of our GDD, our gratitude deficit disorder. You know why it's so important? Because you are born with an urge to complain. Yes, you. Not just the other whiners and moaners around you, but they hear plenty of your complaining too. Because negativity gets your attention so much faster than blessing. Because you want people to feel sorry for you. Pity and attention are like narcotics. And you get attention by whining. You know, we've had years of really hard struggles economically, but most people that I know could afford to lose some weight because we eat too good. And I am right there with you. I can smell a donut at 80 yards. <laughs> Did you know if you drink a Diet Pepsi, you can have two donuts? <laughs> and you've heard me complain more than rejoice, I have no doubt. It, certainly the people in my family have heard more grumbling than praising. We're inclined to do it. We don't think about it and then rationally make choices. Yes, I think I'd like to be a whiner. We're, we're predisposed to be complainers, to be envious, to think, I got nothing. Why does she have everything? Why am I plain and she's so pretty? Why am I struggling and he has a car like that? We resent people that seem to be here when we're here, forgetting that to be here is an awesome place to be. Why do we want to compare ourselves and wish we were somebody else? Who knows what misery they have or what hardships they have to struggle with? We also are takers by nature. Our sin makes us takers and not givers. It makes us feel entitled, like I have a right to things instead of being thankers. We've got to fight that. 
Just because you have become a Christian does not mean that all your old sinful inclinations all of a sudden just go away. They don't. Thankfulness is learned behavior. Parents, you know how you have to teach it to your kids. Whether it's Thanksgiving time or if you're seeing relatives or Christmas time, you know that it's the nature of a human being to take, to grab, and run. Isn't it so? And parents have to say, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you say to grandma? And you know, you, Thank you, grandma. Now can I go? If, you're, if you have small kids around, you know that, that, that thankful behaviors need to, be, need to be taught. You know still how many people around you, when you do something nice for them, how amazed and pleased you are when somebody says thank you. Or you get that old-fashioned antique thing in the mail, a handwritten thank you note, about blows you away because nobody does that anymore. We just take and run like we're entitled to stuff. Today is a great day to slow down and think and thank. To trace back all the good stuff in your life and realize it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence, as you heard in our scripture reading from Deuteronomy. It's not because you're so smart. Don't say it's because of the labor of my hands that have produced this wealth for me. It, trace it back and it is from the generous hand of a God who loves you. Take stock of your spiritual life. You are known, important, valuable, precious, monitored, tracked, identified, supported, surrounded, protected, and loved, washed, and forgiven by a God who follows every move you make in your life because he's so intense about getting you all the way home on a rough, perilous, risky journey. He's given you his word. He's placed his spirit in your heart to be your daily companion. He gives you his washing that whenever you've messed up, you can go back to and claim, I've been baptized. I am wearing the robes of the holiness of Christ. He gives you his word to explain the crazy confusion of the world that we're plunked down in the middle of. And he feeds you with his supper. He gives you the very body and blood that were nailed to the cross and poured out for you so that you can believe with absolute confidence God means me when he says, I love you and forgive you. All these things, all these things come because he is good. He really is good. And his mercy to us really does endure forever. This time, right now, today, all this week, stop, think, and thank. If you agree with that, if you promise to do that, then say amen. amen. Even in the middle of the greatest financial crisis since the Depression, Time of Grace partners and viewers have prayed for us, believed, and have given. Your continuing financial support each month makes an incredible difference in our ability to share this message with the world. I'm really thrilled to have you as my partner. I really do mean you're my ministry partner. Just as you can depend on me to be there regularly for you, I depend on you with your regular support. And in this way, as a Grace Partner, my voice really is your voice answering the Great Commission to bring the good news of Jesus to the world. Never in the history of Time of Grace have we wanted to thank our partners and viewers more than right now. When you give your regular monthly gift and become a Grace Partner, it helps us with the production and airtime cost involved in extending this message to a world desperately in need. Millions more are waiting to hear this precious message, and because of your partnership in the gospel, the world has hope. Did you know that I write a blog each week? A blog is like a newspaper or magazine column, only this one's online. You find it on our website at timeofgraceblog.org. Each week, I take a look at living the Christian life and believing the Christian faith and how that collides with the crazy world we live in and in the sometimes crazy things that happen in our country. Check it out. I'd love to know what you think. Send me an email to let me know if you find that these are interesting to you. I'd also like you to know that my new Grace Moments booklet is ready to go. It's called Accept One Another, and it's a daily devotion based on some words of inspiration and guidance from God's Word, one for each day of your month. I'd love for you to have a copy. Give us a call. 
send an email or send us a letter so that you can get your own copy of Accept One Another. The reason why I wrote it is because racism and suspicion and fear and dislike of people not like you is not just something that was part of our country's troubled racial past but it's a very big part of our present day situation as well. Because of the racism inborn in each of us, we all need God's help to overcome it. For some inspiration for your own daily life, give us a call so that you can get your own copy of Accept One Another. I'd also like to invite you, if you never have before, to consider becoming one of my grace partners. Time of Grace does not self-fund, and it's not magic or the Lord does not just simply drop the funding we need to buy the airtime. But Time of Grace's continued existence depends on people just like you. I invite you today to pray and consider becoming one of my partners with a gift of financial support. I'd like to pray with you today. Let's come to our Lord at this Thanksgiving time and let's give him the glory that he deserves for everything he does to provide for us. Heavenly Father, it is your world that we live in, and you still sustain it. You are still creating enough for all of us. We are all wealthy and rich beyond all belief. We have so been blessed by you. Lord Jesus, your grace and mercy and the forgiveness of sins is our greatest treasure. Thank you. Holy Spirit, your word and the strength you give that we need to believe and live our faith is a powerful gift to us, and we thank you. This Thanksgiving Day, we lift up grateful hearts to our triune God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske, reminding you that every day, especially this time, is a day of God's grace for you. Happy Thanksgiving. Have you ever noticed that in a room full of strangers, you automatically gravitate toward people just like you? Pastor Mark has written a new booklet in the Grace Moment series to capture some of Scripture's amazing stories of how the Spirit of the Lord has been bringing diverse people together for centuries. It's called Accept One Another, and it's based on and inspired by Romans 15, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. To receive your copy, write, call, or visit our website. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. Time of Grace with Mark Jeske has been made possible by the financial support of the Time of Grace viewers and partners in this area. Thank you.